So I, I've been a journalist since I was, I think, 16. And I spent about nine years covering countries in conflict, like the Philippines, like El Salvador, Latin America. And then the Middle East was my last assignment at the Gulf War in 1991. He really seemed to pay attention to war stories. That's what you do, you'd swap war stories because you understood the kind of level of drama and violence and, and bloodshed and sometimes fear that goes along with these things. So I think the fact that I'd had that experience dealt as a foreign correspondent with people who were with the intelligence community, all of that made him feel more comfortable. And here was this thing that the entire world knew about, and he couldn't say anything about it. He was the shooter. I mean, he shot Osama bin Laden, he shot and killed Osama bin Laden. My story starts out with him sitting in my backyard worrying about how he's going to pay the bills and how he's going to keep his wife and kids food and clothes. It actually started with a guy who's a former SEAL, a uh, mentor to the shooter. I met him uh, through some mutual friends. He c it came to a point where he decided he trusted me and told me about this guy. I had a lot of phone conversations with the shooter before I met him face to face. He's a hilariously funny guy. He looks like a football player. The early conversations all happened over glasses of scotch. Getting to the point where he wanted to have me write about him was a tortuous process for him. I think he thought a lot about the loyalty to the SEAL Team 6, to his colleagues and friends. There's a very good chance that, that his name and identity will come out, despite being anonymous in the story. And that's one of his, the calculations that he and his, and his wife made about doing this. And ultimately, what we discussed was you know, if he, could, if he could tell his story and humanize SEAL Team 6 members, which you generally don't get by saying, this isn't a movie, these are real people. They have extraordinary skills, they've been in extraordinary circumstances, but have the same vulnerabilities as most human beings. That's the story he wanted to tell. It was his decision every step of the way, but I think it was a very difficult one for him. When news first came out about the killing of bin Laden, there was a description of what happened. And some of that description turned out to be inaccurate. The original story was that he was killed inside the room by a Navy SEAL, shot in the head. I, I compared and contrasted a lot of the different versions that came out, and then you look at the mock-ups of bin Laden's compound, and you know what's, what's practical, what's, what's reasonable, what could have happened. The shooter has the most credible story that's out there about what happened and his role in it. The way I got there, in some respects, I, I don't want to talk about because they involve communications that were completely off the record. But uh, the things that I mentioned in the story include a dinner in Washington that involved other people who'd been on that mission and acknowledgement that they gave that he was the one. His mentor, who had been uh, very active in the intelligence community, got a very high level government source phone call within hours after the raid saying, it was your guy. General Mike Myatt, who is retired but runs the Marines Memorial Center, told me the U.S. government does a really good job of transitioning people into the military and a really bad job of transitioning them out. The shooter was in the service for 16 years. He's got eye issues, arthritis. He's got blown discs in his neck. He's got blown discs in his back. He couldn't perform optimally, which you had to do on these missions. He made a decision to leave early, as a number of them do, before their 20 years, which means you get no pension. So he had no pension, felt that at some point it would come out as to who shot bin Laden, and there was no protection. He was told the best they could do was some kind of witness protection program that apparently hadn't even been created yet, but they could maybe create one. And someone in the command said to him, um, he thinks half-jokingly, well, you, we can get you a job driving a beer truck in Milwaukee. Change your name. You couldn't ever talk to anybody. You'd lose everything. It would be like a mafia snitch, which is not something he wanted to do. As a journalist, I thought that this story would be illuminating and lead to a conversation about how we treat these guys. Should we treat them differently as a result of what they've done for the country? If you think about the level of expertise that they have, the kind of what might be considered in the, in the civilian world executive skills, and I've talked to CEOs who say we really would value these skills, but there's no system in place 
to help these guys transfer to civilian life and translate their skills into usable skills in the real world. The shooter, you know, has found himself some work, it's a form of consulting, not at all something that, that he believes is going to continue forever or is going to be consistent. If you get into a long conversation with him, you know, he'll talk about being a little unhappy about the way he and, and his colleagues are treated, but he's very focused on you know, what happens next. It's sort of a never quit philosophy with SEAL Team 6, and I think it's very task-oriented, and his task right now is how does he create a life for himself going forward.